Well, it can be phrased very generally. You have n variables taking values in a finite set, and they're, they're subject to um, m random constraints. Okay, and we have seen already seen uh, many examples like this. Uh, perhaps the easiest example is proper Q coloring. And on, let's say you take or just any random graph and vertices, and then you connect for each possible pair, you connect with probability alpha over n. And as Will mentioned, um, there, this is a largely open question to, <coughs> to determine where there exists a proper Q coloring. And this uh, is open for 60 years. Um, <clears throat> of course, there's a lot of progress and very nice work was done by uh, Harris here for regular graph. This is, you take ND even, and then you take uniform among graphs that have uh, degree D. And for this problem, D set of Q was de determined by Kajaglan. Uh, Demu, Harris, and the uh, church. Okay. <clears throat> so for this talk, I'll mostly focus on random Boolean formula, which is I take, so perhaps the canonical model in this class is random KSAT, which is you take X to be zero one or true or false. And, and then you have M constraints, which are drawn uniformly at random. So each constraint, so constraint looks like take or of K variables uniformly at random, and then negate it uniformly at random. So for K equals three, a constraint will look like X1, or negation x2 uh, or x3. And then you put and like m times, okay? So this means that x1, x2, x3 cannot be, you know, like false, true, false. And these constraints are drawn uniformly at random, okay? So this is the KSAT model where and you, we take m, if we fix k, and let n and m go to infinity with some proportional parameter. So in this talk, I'll talk about a slightly variant of this model called random regular non-equal set model. So which is kind of easier to um, derive mathematically, but still quite non-trivial. So in the random regular not equal set model, I impose that x, given such formula, and negation x is also a solution. And then regular means that every variable participates in D clauses. <clears throat> okay. I draw constraints so that every variable is in the same number of constraints. And this can be drawn uh, from a graphical model. So a configuration model as follows. You, so you have M clauses. I, I represent it by square node. And then you have N variables. I represent it by just dots. And then every, if, I, if a variable participates in a clause, I connect them. And since every variable has K number of variables participating, I put k half edges hanging. And then for every variable, I put d half edges. And then I take mk to be equal to nd, okay? So that there are the same number of half, half edges on the, uh, the top and the bottom. And that I connect it uniformly at random. That is, I take an element uniformly from the permutation group. So this is called the configuration model in the random graph literature. And given G, so uh, uh, which consists of variables, F is a set of clauses, and then E is a random element from the edges, the random element from the 
uniform permutation, I need to specify how, how each variable participate in this class, either they're negated or not. So uh, I draw what's called the literals. So for E in H, uh, I draw a little literal uniform at random independently. And then I'll denote this uh, label graph by G script G. I use this notation. And then the definition of the null equals set model is that X is a null equals set solution. Then only if every clause is satisfied, which means that satisfy this. So So if, if I take an indicator, so here O plus means addition in mod two, and then partial A means, you know, variables adjacent to a clause. So if I evaluate the variables adjacent to a clause, then it should not be all zero, not or all one. So NAE is not all equal. Okay. okay. So are there any questions about the model? The model, yeah. Uh, what, what is F? Uh, so F is a set of clauses. So this is one to M, sorry. So this is like factor graph, what they call it. A set of, a set of variables, right. All right, so I'll draw a concrete example just to be on the same page. Let's say I have a two class and then and then three variables, and then literals are zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Then then if I put zero, zero here, every class needs to be satisfied. If I put one here, this class will not be satisfied. So I need to put zero. If I put zero, one. If I put one here, this clause is not satisfied, so I need to put zero. If, and it, by definition of the null equal set, if I negate the solution, they, they should all be solutions. So, so uh, okay, there's solution I missed, zero, one, or uh, one, zero, and then, uh, okay, there should be, I guess, okay, sorry. Okay, you, you get the idea. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, I should explain more. Okay, okay. So given this question, uh, given this model, I can ask, uh, what the satisfiability threshold? So, as uh, Will mentioned, uh, there's a sharp threshold. Remarkably, at least k greater or equals three. Uh, three goods theorem says that there's a point where you know the probability of being satisfied. Uh, sharply uh, decreases from one to zero at some point. And then it's usually for these models, there's a single point and how to characterize uh, the point. And second question is, if, if you're in the satisfiable viability regime, how many are the solution? Okay, so Z, I denote it by solution of G. So, so solution of G is a set of null equals set solution given this graph. So this is so this is a spin system, right? That uh, Harrison will talked about, and you know this is a partition function of this spin system. And up to this, you know, there were a series of talks talking about phase transition in terms of this quantity Z, one over n log Z. This this concentrates for these models. And then, you know, how can we characterize the typical value of one of our log Z? Okay. Third question, one cannot ask about samples of these models. So let's say I take two. Uh, so given the graph, I take two samples, uniform at random, and then I can ask how much do they overlap? 
Okay, so so you know what's a fraction of variables that overlaps, and this is of interest to many statistical physicists. And if they concentrate, you know, how many values do they concentrate, and what are the values? Okay. Fourth question. It's about this new result. It's about local weak limit. So <clears throat> we already seen in Kavita's talk, you can define local weak limit for dynamical systems. You can, of course, do it for the static system as well. So let BT of I be the empirical, oh, sorry. It's a T neighborhood around I. So I is then a variable. So as we've seen, if you, let k, k, so I'm gonna fix k and d and let n n goes to infinity with some proportional parameter. So I'll, I'll let alpha equals m over n, and then this for this model it also equals d over k. So if I let k and d fixed and let n and m goes to infinity, this this graph resulting graph will be locally tree like, as we saw in many of the talks before. So which means that. If I pick a variable, there will be only a few short cycles in this graph. So if I pick a variable, look at a fixed neighborhood, T, it will be like a tree. And in this case, it will be a deterministic tree because I assume that the model is regular. Every variable and every clause has to have the same uh, number of uh, children. So, so it will be like, it will be most likely be a deterministic tree. Vector tree, so you have D variables adjacent and then you know you have k minus one uh sorry d d clauses adjacent and you have k minus one you know children and you go you go on and then you have this bipartite factor p so and then and then okay so the craft st structure is trivial in this sense but if you you can ask if you draw a you form a random solution what does X look like. So X will be, you know, a configuration on zero one in this tree. What does it look like? So <clears throat> one can to be pedantic. So let's, for example, look at so given G, I draw G and then I draw a solution you form at random. Let's look at the empirical distribution of, you know x v t of i and then i'll also look at the joint empirical distribution with literals so given a zero one configuration and also the literals i count you know how many neighbors have this particular neighborhood so so this this modulo cycles which will be rare which is of order one over n <clears throat> this will be a probability distribution on this you know on this graph on this tree right and this will be random right because i drew g and x random so as n goes to infinity does this concentrate and if so how can you characterize it so that's the questions that might arise from these models are there any questions So, no. Uh, so, there is a phase diagram that will already, you know, mentioned in this talk, and this is due to uh, seminal work by physicists Krasakala, Montanari, Chitrasenghi, Semerzian, and Zagorova. Zero seven. So let's say I look at if I look at two solutions. And then say x1 and x2 are connected if they differ by a variable, which means that you know I have zero one configuration. If I can flip a variable and then get go to another sol solution, I declare they're connected. Okay, I define cluster to be a connected component of this solution. Cluster is connected component. Of solution 
OK, so if I have this notion, so the physicist has a very nice prediction how these mo models behave. So I look at x axis, which is alpha. So alpha, remember, was the number of constraints per variables. So if I increase alpha, which mean, it means that you know, I'm increasing the constraint. So if alpha is low, one can think of I can move from one solution to another by a path. So because I have a lot of freedom, you know, most solution will be in one cluster. And this is exactly what happens up to alpha uniqueness. And this uniqueness is exactly what Harris talked about, you know, you know where the, this is where the uh, phase transition happens. And after this point, there will be many clusters, but most of the solutions will lie in a single cluster. And this hold, holds up to what's called alpha clustering or sharing uh, threshold. And this is conjectured to be coincided with what's called the reconstruction threshold, which I'll probably not mention. And after this point, solution uh, splits into exponentially many clusters. And then each cluster has, is far apart. You need to flip linear number of variables to go from one cluster to another. And then this holds up to alpha condensation. And after condensation, what happens is that solution space condense into largest number of largest clusters. So there will be bounded number of clusters, so which dominate the solution space. And then after condensation, there's no solution with high probability. So this is what physics conjecture. Okay, so we'll be interested in this condensation regime. Why? One reason to do why we are interested in this condensation regime is that, okay, these four questions, if you look at alpha set of K, you know, alpha set of K is just, you know, just the threshold. But you, if you look at the other three questions, they all have the same phase transition exactly at this point, alpha condensation. And that's what we managed to prove for this special case of random regular non set model. And I'll definitely need to mention that these alpha uh, sizes, I, I drew them as if they're you know, equidistant, but that's not true, of course. The as k gets large, alpha unique actually shrinks to zero. This is log k over k. So this threshold is very small. And alpha cluster is on the size of up two to the k log k over k. And these two are of the same order, which is two to the log k, the k log two. So this is will be a bounded size as k goes to infinity. This will shrink, and these two sizes are you know what's kind of the most. But still, there there will be you know constant number of size for fixed k. And oh, <clears throat> uh, one nice open question is what happens here. You know, as what goes beyond uniqueness. So Harris talked about this. Our, our theory is very lacking. So spectral independence, all those things, is all holds up to this shrinking regime. And to, up to, to the K, like uh, the best result, I think, is a recent result by Henkar Moitra, Nityamani, and Zongchen Chen, which is far away, maybe like to the K or 52 or something like that, for K set model. Uh, which region? In what sense? It might be possible. Right, but it's true that the uniqueness of the BP fixed point certainly doesn't, it's, it's very beyond. Oh, I see. Right. You're saying like there is like. Right. So actually, okay. I, I really being a little bit a little bit impressive. This is really like conjectured picture. So we don't really know what happens. So if I say differ by a variable, 
I say they differ by log n variable. Okay, I, this is another notion of clusters. It's conjectured to be the same phase transition. So it's really cluster. It, it doesn't even you know make sense what a cluster means at least you know. So mathematically speaking, we don't know much about you know these models. Uh, we do know by David's very nice Davis work that there is a you know there is a point around very close to the clustering threshold that you know there is an overlap what's called overlap gap, which kind of prevents local algorithms to find solutions or local algorithms to mix. Okay, so we do know that. This picture is already pretty much open for a other than random regular logical set. For a random case set, proper Q coloring, you can also think of maximum independent set. We've been talking about hardcore model. For a maximum independent set, uh, this picture actually is conjectured to hold. So if you look at G regular and D, and they look at the size of, you, you can ask about the size of the maximum independent set. This picture is only conjectured to hold for D greater than or equal to 20. And D less than that, there will be, it's conjectured that there will be infinitely many hierarchy of clusters, clusters within clusters that Will has talked about, which is called full RSD. So yeah, we don't know much, um, but I'll talk about what we knew, do know in this talk, which is about this null equal set model, which is the only model that we know. So, so if you look at the free energy, one over n log C, up to alpha condensation, it will be linear. And then after this point, it will be non-analytic. Okay. So <clears throat> this linear point is what's called the anneal free energy. We talked about this again. This is, this is one over n log of expectation z. So for this part particular model, it's very easy to calculate expectation of d. So expectation Z is you have two to the N number of possible configuration. And if you fix a configuration, let's say zero, 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 the probability of you know, each clause being satisfied, I, this, every literals are independent. So if I condition on the graph, I, this means that if I fix a configuration, this means that the literal cannot be zero, 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 nor one, one, one. So this puts two constraints. So each, each clause has one minus two over two to the K probability of satisfying it. And then there are m number of clauses. So this is very easy to calculate. And this anneal free energy is log two. So from this alpha log of one minus two over the k. So this is a li linear alpha. However, this is a, of course, upper bound due to uh, Jensen's inequality. This no longer is true after alpha condensation. Okay, so I should mention some literature. So for random regular non-equal set, um, alpha set for large enough k, this is conjecture to hold up to k equals 3, but it was shown for large enough k, let's say k equals 20. Um, this is done by Ding Sly Sun, uh, 13. And the free energy and the condensation threshold for all gain for large enough k, was done by Sly Sun Zhang in, six, in 16. And then this bounded number of clusters, this was verified by large enough K for random regular non equal set model, Nam Sly and myself, 21. And then in our paper, we do, uh, we do more than this. As I said, the overlap also has a phase transition exactly at alpha condensation. So below alpha condensation, if you sample, you know, if you believe this picture, if you sample two solutions uniformly at random, this each cluster is there exponentially many, and each cluster has exponentially small fraction of total solution space. So if you sample two, two solutions, they'll be far apart. So, so below alpha condensation, so if you look at the overlap, it will be one half. For this model, the overlap will concentrate on one half. One half is what you get if you have you know, independent solution. And after alpha condensation, 
we show in our paper that uh, this is one half, one half plus minus p star. Uh, this is, so it takes, it can be, it can take three values, one half and one half plus minus p star. And this plus minus is due to the symmetry of the model. Usually physicists express two, two points. And this is exactly what they mean by one step replica symmetry breaking in this region. And why? So if you sample two solutions, since there are bounded number of clusters, with positive probability, they will be in the same cluster. And with positive probability, they will be in a different cluster. If they're in a different cluster, the overlap is one half. If, there is, if, they're, if they're in the same, same cluster, it will be correlated. It's one half plus P star. But if you negate a cluster, there will be also a cluster for a non equal set model. If, if two solutions are, in, are negated, then it is one half minus P star. Okay. And P star is, of course, you know, explicit. It's a function of alpha and K. And we, we, uh, we verify that. Um, also, I'm going to mention what's the question four? Well, question four also has a description. So below alpha condensation, what happens is that, you know, even though this X is a non equal set solution, so it should satisfy some global constraint, right? But below condensation, what happens is that if you average this empirical distribution, then it's as if you don't have any constraints outside. So this below alpha condensation threshold will be P tilde star of T. Well, P tilde star of T is just the free measure on this graph, on this tree, which is that, you know, free measure meaning that I draw uniformly at non-equal set instance, and then I draw uniformly at non-equal set solution. And that has a very simple description, which can be described in a Markovian way. So let's, for simplicity, let's assume that the literals are all zero. Then at the variable, I choose zero or one, uniformly at random. Then condition on the, on the root, I pick these, you know, children, you know, this, if, if it were zero, it, it means that this cannot be all zero nor all one. Uh, it, ca it cannot be all zero, sorry. Um, so condition that I, you know, I draw this children independently of other branches, and then I go, go for it. So this, ca this is, this can be described in a Markovian way and called the, what's called the broadcast model in the statistics. <clears throat> so this, below this, this is P, P tilde star of T. This is just a free measure on the tree. After this, well, it is, we, we show, it is true that this concentrates on the scale of one over square root of N, but on a different measure in a non-Markovian measure. So it's theorem, uh, by by myself, uh, 23. Uh, if you look at condensation regime, there exists some P, P star of T, which is non-Markovian, okay, such that uh, the total variation distance of per square root of n, where C depends on epsilon. So I fix T, and this holds with probability greater than one minus epsilon. Are there any questions about the well? Good question. That is random. So what we show, so I'm being very, <laughs> I don't want to be very pedantic. So this should, but so, okay. Very nice open question for you guys. So, okay. Oh, okay. So <laughs> one, one more. So, okay. We show in our paper, there is a Z. So this slice and Zhang result, they figure out the free energy and the exponential level. So if you figure out one of it log Z, Z is like E to the N times some constant, but you know, what is the, is there a polynomial correction? You don't know. Well, we figure out Z fluctuates. Z is tight around explicit value, which is 
n to the minus 1 over 2 lambda star, there's a polynomial correction term, n to the minus 1 over 2 lambda star times e to the n s star. So s star is, of course, this. And a lambda star s star, of course, depends on alpha and k. Very nice open question is this. Um, the, if you lay out the largest cluster size, then this should be Poisson Dirichlet. The fraction of the uh, largest cluster should be Poisson Dirichlet to the lambda star. Okay. And what Will asked about, the truth is the probability of being one half and probability of one half plus minus p star should be described in terms of Poisson Dirichlet. Well, we show that we, we show that it concentrates the outside these values. You know, solutions cannot take overlap, and each, you know, overlap takes value with probability delta, but exact probability should be random. If you believe this picture, according to you know Poisson, if you sample two solutions at random, uh, two clusters at random, if they're if they're the same or not, is should be random according to Poisson Dirichlet lambda stuff. So we cannot, yeah, yeah, delta is in exactly, right, right, right. So, right, exactly. So, right, so overlap, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good question. I mean, are you fixing alpha here? So, That's true. So, but if you don't, I think it, it should shrink, right? So this lambda star can the entire values from zero to one. When when so lambda star for alpha condensation, this is one. Alpha set, this is zero. So I was I was I'm wondering if you, you know, so you were saying maybe there's a uniform bound on delta in this regime. Yeah, probably not. I think because Poisson Dirichlet. Yeah, I I would guess not, but. Yeah, I need to check, but not sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, go ahead. That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, right, so if I want to describe it formally, um, I will need another 45 minutes, but right. So, so this is like, so P star of T is still a Gibbs measure, but what's, what's interesting, so P star of T is something like, you know, you know, if I fix a boundary condition, then if, if you believe that theorem, it should be really uniform, right? Be, I, because you're just taking empirical distribution. If you fix a boundary condition and look for, you know, the local says it should be uniform. But the mixture of this boundary condition is come from uh, some random measure, which is correspond to one RSDBP fixed point. Right, so, yeah, exactly. So, right, so, and then there's a random mixture to that, right, the, because the boundary conditions are random, right? Yeah, something like that, yeah. I, I can, maybe I can talk more about it after I do more formal kind of calculations. Any questions, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Replica symmetric region, it should, it should be the same fluctuation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But this is really, this is due to the probably na nature of the non equal set model. I, since I'm looking at locally homogeneous model, this one over square, I think K set model certainly shouldn't like to be like this. Yeah, but our proof can really show a lower bound to this as well. So, okay. So there's a lower bound to this. So this is really tight. With high probability, it's lower bounded by C1 over square root of n, upper bound is of C2 square root of n. So the partition function, so we, we so okay, again I'm being, so partition function should be C1 n to the, what we show in our paper, this is with the, uh, the Niname Allen slide, so partition function, there should be some C1 and C2, we did, which depends on epsilon, such that 
this holds with probability one minus epsilon. <laughs> oh, okay. It's C1 times. Right. Right. So, oh, no, no, no. It's a, it's a constant fluctuation. Z has multiplicative content. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, so yes, I, I should. Okay, I forgot to do this. So this result is not highly non-trivial. This result is by, in particular, okay, for small enough alpha, it should be probably easy. But getting up to the condensation threshold is highly non-trivial, and it was done by. Uh, Kaja Glan. Uh, there was one author that I know. Um, Kaja Glan and um, uh, Sapetano Pos and Muller. And Muller in 18. So below condensation, yeah, so Z over expectation Z, what they did was they figured out the exact limiting distribution. Which is, you know, just by small subgraph conditioning, it's like, you know, there's subgraph counts and then there's a multiplicative of fluctuation comes from the counts of the cycles. Well, if you want to do so, okay, this go back to the will question. Z, the fluctuation of Z should be, in principle, should be coming from Poisson Dirichlet. We don't know Poisson Dirichlet, so we don't know the fluctuation of Z exactly. So, okay, conjecture is that if I take log Z, minus log of this guy, it should, con it should converge to in distribution to a fun function that depends on Poisson Dirichlet. That's the conjecture if you believe this, but we don't know Poisson Dirichlet, we just show tightness result. So it's a multiplicative error. And this is the right order of uh, Austin Dust law, of course. And, uh, any other questions? Okay, I have five minutes of time. Um, okay, so so why does condensation happen? You know, uh, one one thing one can look at is you know complexity curve. Okay, maybe I should write in blue. So complexity curve. So physicists expect that if you let sigma of s to be the one over n log of number of clusters of size e to the ns, e to the ns plus one, if you look at this multiplicative window, <sighs> then this quantity should concentrate and looks like following. So th this is S, this is sigma of S. Below condensation, this curve will look like this, okay? And <clears throat> so if you know sigma of S, expectation Z is easy to calculate, which is some S in one over N grid e to the n times s plus sigma of s. So this means that expectation z is dominated by s. Oh, so, okay. Of course, this is uh, about max uh, e to the n times maximum of this quantity. Um, this is, so, this means that expectation Z is dominated by S where the complexity function has derivative negative minus one. So if, so this will be like, there will be a point such that the derivative is minus one. So it would be like this. And this is a complex, so this is a complexity curve where alpha is less than alpha condensation. Remember, alpha is the number of constraints. If you increase the number of constraints, the 
whatever, wherever you look, the complexity curve will go down. At some point, this red dot will be on the x-axis. This is where this has derivative minus one. And this is where exactly the condensation happens. And below condensation, what's giving dominant contribution to the expectation z, you no, no longer see in a typical cluster. So the largest cluster you actually see is of, of size this size, a star, which is strictly smaller than the what's maximizing expectation, this. And you know, sigma, since sigma of s star is zero, it's sub-exponential, right? It turns out it is bounded. There's a bounded number of clusters that dominate the solution space. And then alpha sat is where the whole complexity curve will be below x-axis. So this is what physicists predict. And OK, so OK. So for the rest, maybe two or three minutes, I'll, I didn't talk any, anything about the proof. Maybe I'll talk a little bit. So indeed, this is, what, uh, this is the intuition that we use in our proof. So in order to, have, in order to study what happens typically in, a, in, a, in the condensation regime, we need to study, uh, we weight the cluster size to the pi power of lambda. So this is like, um, this is defined to be gamma cluster, and then you weight the cluster size to the lambda. So this is like, so if you calculate the expectation of z lambda, then this is e to the n times maximum of s lambda s plus sigma of s. So, you know, I, if I tune lambda, you know, and then I look at, if I tune lambda appropriately, so by the way, the lambda star there, and also what's appearing here, should be the minus slope of, of this guy on the x-axis. So lambda star is a minus slope of that. So what we need, really need to do is, I need to study the spin system, okay, cluster, Cluster, it turns out, cluster can be expressed as marginals, as we'll, we'll talked about. So clusters, I won't have time to go over this, but clusters should be M. It has one-to-one -one correspondence. You send messages on each directed, uh, directed uh, edge. And then this is each and taking probability space in this, the square. And then what, if you express it like this, each cluster size, it's a function of M. And this M, which solves the BP fixed point, is again behaving like a spin. And then we need to, do a, we need to analyze a spin system where I weight the size of the uh, BP fixed point to the ratio of the lambda. Okay? And then it, we, we tilt lambda appropriately to make, you know, to study what's happening in typically. And then this, of course, p star t, you know, depends on this lambda star through BP fixed point of this this n. That's why I didn't go over. It. Perhaps I should stop now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. So. Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yes, yes. That's true. The short answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. So this is. So this is. Right. So this is frozen. So I didn't have time to go over this, but so it has, so we, we really show these are one to one um, correspondence. So if you have a solution and then do maybe, you know, like coarsening algorithm, like you have a variable and then you flip if, if it doesn't negate any cause. So this will be like zero, one to the three to the B. Then this M is corresponding to, you know, we show in our paper with the Denny and Ellen that these trees are arranged in trees. 
So fraction of free variables, since you're so far in the satisfied with threshold, the fraction of free variables is very low. It's about, it has a linear fraction, but as similar to the K. And we show in our paper, they're arranged in trees. So you have a free variable like this. The simplest tree is you have a clause like this. And the next, next uh, simplest tree is you have a free variable joined by a clause like this. This M's are, if you look in, in the free trees and then try to compute the marginal, if you, if you try to do a you know, null equal says kind of thing on this tree, then you can do it by BP uh, dynamic programming. This is what, and the this M's are bidirectional messages that, yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, this is all, it could be large. It's not so bad, 30, about 30. I think I was, it was interested in this question. If you optimize, probably get around 15. That's my guess, but um, yeah. yeah. That's a good question. I think there is. I think the answer is there is. I think Andrea has a. I because they 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 don't say sub-exponential. They really say you know, Poisson Dirichlet, right? So, so I think the, yeah, there. I didn't really understand. <laughs> and this is not the way we go about proving these things. Is that, yeah, I didn't really. It's they tilt the measure by one over n. Yeah, it's really on the physics level, so I didn't really understand. But yeah, this I understood. But <laughs> but yeah, there, there is an argument like that. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> 